right. We'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the second seminar in Water in the Native World seminar series, featuring papers in a special issue I was the guest editor for. The special issue is called Water in the Native World, and papers are about water challenges facing tribes, where indigenous scientists and community members and students lead and are involved in addressing the challenges. Uh, you can download the special issue at ucower.org, and I will also put it in the chat box so that everybody can get a direct link. And so um, I encourage you all to um, join in the other webinars that we'll be having. So the next one will be next Wednesday. And I would also be um, uh, related to this talk as well on arsenic. And that's going to be next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Um, by Dr. Catherine Proper and Marie Jones. So I'm really um, honored to introduce the speakers today. Uh, and I really look up to Jenny Ingram. And it's really um, an honor to work with her collabor collaboratively in other projects. So the Jenny Ingram, Dr. Jenny Ingram and Lizzie Jones will be talking today about dissolve uranium and arsenic on the Navajo Nation uh, for unregulated water sources. Um, so on the Navajo Nation, there are about 30% of the Navajo people don't have access to running water. And so as a result of this, there's a risk of Navajos resorting to non-potable water sources. Um, I myself uh, grew up on the Navajo Nation and didn't have running water or electricity. And today my parents, my family, they um, also have to haul water. And so many people live like this way where they have to drive many uh, miles just to get water. So in addition to the lack of access to um, water and energy and also food, the Navajo Nation has over 500 abandoned uranium mines. And so there's um, challenges of contamination to these water sources and also naturally occurring um, arsenic uh, it, that can be found in these waters. So the paper that Dr. Ingram and her team has worked on is uh, stemming back many decades where They've been uh, working in water quality across the Navajo Nation, looking at unregulated wells, focusing primarily on the western side of the Navajo Nation. So they tested for uranium and arsenic. And so their paper, their, their work that they'll be presenting today is um, very important because uh, Dr. Ingram and her group have been able to um, collaborate outside their group um, and consolidate these um, data for water quality, as well as um, collect data that was lacking prior to her work. Especially since uh, water quality is uh, important in terms of um, health because these unregulated groundwater sources may pose a health risk to Navajos. And so um, her work is important for protect, protection of health of Navajo citizens. And then also Navajo Nation has um, uh, um, not as much uh, access to surface water. And so when she's looking at these groundwater sources, um, there's also, uh, her work also informs tribal managers about um, the sources that maybe have potential for drinking water with treatment. So, um, so it's great that she's um, do, engaging in this work. And then also I want to um, everybody to know that also her work really um, demonstrates the importance of community engaged research in hydrologic sciences, where she had to get access for, um, she had to get approvals to do the work that she's doing and the communities led in the work that she's doing. So it's a real great example about transparency, reporting back to uh, the stakeholders and the tribal communities 
So without further ado, I'm very honored to introduce um, the speakers for today, Lindsay Jones and Dr. Jenny Ingram. Lindsay Jones holds a master's in environmental sciences and policy from NAU. She graduated in 2019 and her thesis work focused on uranium and arsenic contamination on, this, on the Navajo Nation. She's currently the environmental program supervisor at Arizona's Water Infrastructure and Finance Authority. Dr. Jenny Ingram investigates environmental contaminants with respect to their impact on health. And her research um, stems, characterizes uh, uranium and arsenic in water, soil, plants, and livestock. So her research uh, fosters collaborations with Native American communities and leaders to build trust, obtain access to field samples, and gain insights into their health concerns. She is a member of the Navajo Nation. She's from the Nanashteji clan, and she was named the 2018 recipient of the American Chemical Society Award for encouraging disadvantaged students into the careers of chemical sciences. So without further ado, I will now give it over to our speakers. Um, yate, and thank you, um, Carletta, for that wonderful introduction. Um, this is Jana Ingram, and I'm going to start our presentation, and then I'm going to hand it off to Lindsay. And um, I just wanted to state that this, this particular manuscript is based on um, Lindsay's thesis work that she did in my lab. Um, our co-workers on this uh, project, uh, another professor from um, Northern Arizona University, Rod Parnell, who's in the Environmental Science and Geosciences Department, and then Jonathan Credo, who has worked in my lab for quite a while. He's now at the University of Arizona, and he's in the MD-PhD program. So next slide. So just an outline of what we're going to discuss with you. We're going to talk a little bit about the uranium mining out on Navajo and policies that affect the abandoned and the legacy mining, some health effects, and really the literature that drove us to um, try to um, fill the gaps. Um, and then um, we'll talk a little bit about the study area um, and give you our objectives. Um, we'll talk very, very briefly about our methods. We can talk more about that if anyone has questions, but we really wanna dive into the results and, and give you some information. We actually are not gonna talk about the sodium chloride mixing model because we just don't have enough time. But um, if you have questions about that, Lindsay can address those. And then how, um, in particular, Lindsay spent a lot of really quality time disseminating the results and really taking um, a few different approaches. So, and then we'll conclude with um, um, some comments about the impact of this work and, and then we'll allow for some questions. So next slide. So as Carletta mentioned, on Navajo, on the reservation, there's, there's approximately 30% of the homes that don't have regulated water. And so people need to haul water and you know, people will haul from a, a variety of different sources, including coming into town, so to speak, and getting regulated water. But sometimes, for example, in the times we're living in now with the pandemic, you know, there's lockdowns and you can't go very far. And so people are actually relying more on these unregulated sources as we believe. So that they are very important, even though they were meant for livestock. Um, and then the other issue is, as again, Carletta mentioned, there were uranium mines, many mines on Navajo. And so it was one of the biggest places in the United States where uranium was mined during um, the mid 1900s. Next slide. So um, if you're not familiar, this is a map of the Navajo Nation. It's located in the um, northeastern part of Arizona, the northwestern part of New Mexico, and the southern um, western part of Utah. So it's right in the Four Corners area. Again, if you're not familiar with the reservation, it's actually um, uh, or, or um, there's different boundaries. So there are things called chapters and something called an agency. So the chapters, are, if you think about it, are kind of like counties within a state. 
And then the agencies are sort of like states within the Navajo Nation. So we're going to be talking about, to your far um, left, Western Agency, which is um, obviously located in the western part of Navajo, where um, much of the work that we do, if you go directly south of Western Agency, you would hit Flagstaff, which is where NAU is located. Um, so, so just to orientate yourself, the other thing is that you, the, on this map, what you see is all these X's. Those X's are um, the abandoned uranium mines. So the AUM, or five, and there's about 500 of them, but there also were other mine features throughout Navajo, and there's an estimate of about 1,200. And so um, these mine features and these abandoned mines were, most of them were not um, remediated or they were only barely remediated. So they left behind this legacy of issues, of environmental issues um, that we have been investigating um, including um, elevated levels of uranium and arsenic in water. So next slide. So um, another issue back in the day when there was mining going on, um, th there really was very little protective um, gear for folks that were working in these mines. So the Navajo um, workers were exposed to um, uranium in a variety of different exposure routes such as um, particulate and even water within the mines that they were, you know, drinking and bringing home this dust to their families. So there was seen an elevated level of lung cancer within the Navajo um, miners and, and really there wasn't as much smoking as other parts of the country. So that wasn't um, the reason why they, they had these elevated levels of lung cancer and really looking at it with respect to the uranium and, and also radon exposure for these folks um, because there was so little protection back then. Next slide. Um, so some of the, um, the policies that have been um, introduced with respect to uranium mining are shown on this slide. So there are um, Superfund sites um, at some of the um, abandoned mine areas, um, which are regulated under um, CERCLA. There is also the Uranium Mills Tailing Radiation Control Act, or UMTRCA, as well as Uranium My Mills Tailings Remedial Action, or UMTRA, that um, oversee um, the, the remediation efforts um, toward trying to um, really clean up these sites. Um, back in 2005, the, the Navajo Nation um, introduced the Diné Natural Resources Protection Act, which actually um, said that the, the na nation no longer wanted any more uranium on uh, uranium mining on the reservation. And it was really um, part of a cultural look at the issues, lo looking at the Navajo fundamental laws. Next slide. So why are we concerned with, in particular, arsenic and uranium? Well, this slide is telling you some of the health effects. So um, arsenic, this is your chemistry moment, is actually not a metal. It's a metalloid. So it has a little bit, or it has a bit bif different um, effects in the body than, uh, say, a heavy metal. All right, it can, it can be in a variety of different forms, which give us, gives it different toxicities. Um, it's definitely known as a carcinogen. You know, it naturally is occurring and we see particularly higher levels in the Western part of the United States. And as you can see the, the different um, uh, organs and tissues that it, it can really affect. And uranium is a metal, it's a heavy metal. So we can look, think about it in terms of its uh, metal chemistry. So it's a toxic metal, but we also know that uranium has radioactivity um, behaviors. And so there's also those high energy um, part particles that come out that can do damage. And those are also known to be carcinogenic. Um, it is also naturally occurring. We, you know, you would take any kind of sample in the environment and you would see at least a little bit of uranium, but we definitely are interested in, in, in those elevated levels. And it also can impair um, functioning of a lot of our organs and tissues. In particular, we see kidney can or kidney disease, and it is linked to cancer. So next slide. 
So another reason for the work that we're doing is because there is a gap in the information on arsenic and uranium levels in the western part of Navajo Nation. Both of these papers is from the University of New Mexico, led by um, Joe Hoover, who's now at Montana State Billings. Um, so they did some work looking at levels of um, uranium and arsenic in unregulated wells, but most of their work was not done on Western Navajo, but more in the central and Eastern part of Navajo. And so the work that we have been doing really is trying to focus on filling in the information um, with respect to the unregulated wells on Navajo in the Western Agency. And just so you know, we are working with the folks at UNM to try and bring our data sets together so that we can have um, a large database of as many of the unregulated wells throughout Navajo Nation as possible um, in order to give that information to um, the nation for them to make decisions. So I'm going to hand this off to Lindsay and she's going to talk to you about her work. Right, thank you, Jamie. So yes, here is a map of the study area that we focused on. As Jamie mentioned, there's this gap in the western portion of Navajo Nation. So we uh, attempted to fill in some of these um, areas with information from the different wells. So um, we tested about, it was 82 unregulated water sources, and those include windmill wells, hand pumps, spigots, and shallow dug wells. Um, as you can see, most of the abandoned uranium mines occurred in the Cameron and Coal Mine Canyon chapters here. Um, a majority of them were near the Little Colorado River, and they were mostly open pit mines that, um, um, except for a small subset, so there's four deep vertical shafts that likely extended below the water table. So this is the study area and all of the wells that we tested. Um, and then it's important when we're talking about any sort of groundwater study to mention the geology beneath the Navajo Nation. So um, here's just some cross sections of the geology that you'll find um, in the northern portion of western Navajo. Uh, you'll see more of the geology that's shown on the left here where you have um, the Navajo sandstone is still present. Um, and that's the reason why the N aquifer is a very important aquifer for the northern portions of Western Navajo. And then on the right side, you'll see the cross section where it shows um, a sample of what you'll find in the southern portion of our study area where the Navajo sandstone has been eroded away. So the underlying uh, Coconino sandstone is a little bit closer to the surface and therefore the sea aquifer is a uh, major aquifer for that region in the southern portion of the study area. Um, so here are some maps that display the results that we got from a well database that's maintained by the Navajo Department of Water Resources. So in this database, they had information on the aquifer that the well was um, pulling water from, as well as the uh, depth of the well. Um, so on the left, you'll see the map. Um, you'll see a lot of gray um, circles indicating that the aquifer was unknown for that well. However, there's some overall uh, trends that you can definitely notice on the map, where, like I said, in the northern portion, many of the wells are accessing the N aquifer, and then in the southern portion, many of the wells are accessing the C aquifer. And then on the other map, you'll see the well depths, and um, they are definitely very variable, but the well depths ranged anywhere from 100 feet to uh, 1,500 feet. So my main research question was focused on determining if uranium and arsenic levels vary temporally or spatially in unregulated wells. Some factors which we think could affect the concentration levels includes just the natural influence of seasonal recharge patterns or variations in the distribution of natural deposits, um, as well as the human-caused influences from the mining activity. And then other processes um, include the redox 
um, conditions and complexation reactions or groundwater mixing and flow patterns. So the primary objectives of my research were to first just provide insights on the health risks that the you know, spatial and temporal variability of uranium and arsenic were posing for the Navajo people. And then the second major objective was to communicate these results back to the local Navajo people. That final um, objective to determine the hydrogeochemical processes responsible for the distributions that we found um, definitely proved to be a more difficult objective to fulfill and hopefully it'll be something we can look at more in the future. So prior to beginning the field work, we had to obtain resolutions granting us permission to test these wells. Um, since the Navajo Nation is a sovereign nation, we didn't want to um, just be going out without their permission and collecting water. So to get the permission to collect water, we obtained uh, resolutions. Um, so luckily my lab group had already had prior resolutions with the Cameron and Luke chapters. Um, so I worked on get, getting several other resolutions passed by the chapters. And then we took um, all of the chapter resolutions to the Western Agency meeting and requested just the overall resolution to allow our group to test any of the wells that we could find in the Western Agency. So my field methods included locating the wells with the GPS which often uh, it was the most difficult part of the field work, especially given you know, the terrain and the types of roads that we were having to drive on. Um, but once we were able to locate the well, we would first collect the water by, um, by first flushing the pipes for several minutes to you know, get any stagnant water out of the pipe. We'd rinse the sampling container, filter the water into a, a clean container, and then acidify the samples um, with nitric acid to reduce the pH and store the metals in a soluble state. Um, we also collected other field data with a handheld probe just to measure the pH, temperature, the ORP, and then the specific conductivity. Um, and I won't really be going into those results in this presentation. We'll just focus on the arsenic and uranium results. Um, but I also just wanted to make it clear that, you know, our water sampling methods were different from typical groundwater studies since we really wanted to collect the water in a way that was consistent with how the local Navajo people collected their water. So it would be a representative um, concentrations that they would be encountering and be the same kind of way. So we weren't you know, directly pumping water from a well, but instead collecting it from a storage tank or from a um, spigot like you can see there. So my lab methods involve the use of uh, ICPMS to analyze the samples for uranium and arsenic. And then I used the flame AA to analyze for the major cations listed here. Um, for the major anions and the total inorganic and organic carbon, I sent samples to the Arizona Lab of Emerging Contaminants at U of A, and they analyzed those down there. Um, and like I said, we'll just be focusing on the uranium and arsenic results that we found. So this slide shows um, a few graphs of the data. So the graph on the left is everything that was collected in 2018. Um, so we tested these wells multiple times throughout the year to examine if some seasonal variation existed. And also on this graph, I excluded the samples that were above 90 parts per billion just to make the data a little easier to visualize. Um, that data was then combined with past data collected by the Ingram Lab Group to examine the long-term variability. Um, so we have data that goes back on some of these wells back until 2003. However, for some of them, the you know, data sets are kind of incomplete since only a subset of wells have been continuously tested since 2003. So there are still some gaps in the data. Um, and then also on the graphs, you can see the, the lines. So the, um, the blue line is at the maximum contaminant level of 30 parts per billion for uranium. 
And then the orange line is at 10 parts per billion for the MCL for arsenic. So after we organized all of the data, um, we ended up making these uranium and arsenic concentrate to better visualize all of the data. Um, so as you can see, we found some very high levels of uranium and those were um, in the Cameron and Coal Mine Canyon chapters, um, you know, fairly close obviously to the past uranium mining, um, the abandoned uranium mines, which are shown with the X's there. Um, so definitely a, a wide range in numbers, but the highest levels you can see with the large red um, dots. And then um, just to zoom in a little to the area with the high levels, you can see uh, the coal mine and Cameron chapters here. Um, so the coal mine chapter definitely ended up being one of our more interesting chapters in terms of water quality. Um, as you can see in the southwestern portion, we had some very high levels of uranium. However, just a short distance away in um, the north uh, eastern part of the chapter, they had levels that were much closer to background. And the difference in concentration could be caused by a number of different variabilities, um, including just the natural distribution of the uranium ore, or it could be caused by the disturbances from the mining activities, or from the movement of groundwater, which um, would definitely be affected by the large canyon that runs diagonally through the chapter. Um, and then I also wanted to point out that while paddock wells showed an overall decreasing trend in the concentration of uranium, most wells that had changes in concentration really showed no linear trends. Instead, they had levels that were going up and down over time. Um, and I'll discuss why we didn't really find many linear trends in a future slide or why we believe we didn't. So again, similar to our, or similar to uranium, we created uh, arsenic concentration map. Um, and again, we had some very high levels in the Cameron and Coal Mine Canyon chapters, um, but we also found that there were other areas such as in Tuba City and in Loop that had levels that were approaching or exceeding the 10 parts per billion um, MCL for arsenic. So again, zooming in though, um, just a similar map as before. Um, and again, with arsenic, it was difficult to find any really significant linear trends. Um, and we'll be discussing that in a minute. So a major component of my work was to create a report which could be given back to the chapters because we really wanted to make sure that everything that we were finding, we reported to them and made them aware of the water quality issues that we found. So I created this report, which was about 30 pages long. Um, we divided it into the sections for each chapter. So on the, the right side of the screen, you can see a example of what one of the sections looked like. So it included maps of the well locations, the bar graphs of the results, and then just some details on any of the other water quality issues that we found. Um, so the recommendations that we provided in the report were that any of the wells that we found to have really high levels of uranium, arsenic, nitrites, or nitrates should have signage added so that it would be warning people of the risk and discourage them from using it for their drinking water. Um, we did not want to give them a recommendation that they should be closing or preventing the use of any of these wells. Since the wells are also used for livestock, as you can see from the pictures um, on the screen right now, um, and they could still, they very well may be still considered safe to be used for that purpose. So the main goal of our report though was, like I said, to make sure that they had all of the information available and that was so that the Navajo people and the Navajo officials could use that information to make the decisions for themselves on what should be done with these wells. 
As Danny mentioned, um, a really important part of my work was the dissemination of all of the results. So after creating the report, I ended up doing several presentations at different chapter meetings. Um, I was invited to like the grazing committee meeting in Cameron, which had chapter officials from nearby chapters. Um, and then we also presented the results at the Western Agency meeting, which had chapters officials from all of the Western Agency chapters. I mailed hard copies and emailed digital copies of the report to all of the chapters in my study, um, as well as to the Navajo EPA and the Water Resources Department. So we just tr tried our hardest to make sure this information was made available to anyone who would want to be seeing it. Um, and I also want to note that you know collaboration throughout this whole process was really critical. Um, we, you know, during the initial stages of the project, we were able to make some really good contacts. For example, we had the Chuba City Grazing Permittee official. Um, he helped to show us a lot of locations of wells that our group had never tested before and that he indicated, you know, that the community would really like to know the results of. Um, and then when it came time to be presenting the results back to the community, um, this collaboration proved to still be, you know, very useful and helpful as he um, invited us to different meetings to present the results. Um, and then also, I just wanted to say that, you know, disseminating the results back, it was very important to look at the different um, levels. So not only presenting it to the chapter officials who could then pass it on to their residents, but also directly to the chapter residents which was why it was really important that we attended some of the chapter meetings in person. So before I get on to the, my uh, final conclusion slide, I just wanted to go over a few things that we really had to consider while doing this study. Um, like I said, it was not a typical um, hydrogeology kind of water quality study because we had a lot of variability in the types of unregulated wells that we were testing. So while most of the wells were windmill powered, um, we also had several spigots, hand pumps, and shallow dug wells, which makes generalizing the results very difficult. And then also the windmill wells um, that we did test were also widely variable. So for example, some of the windmill wells pump water into open holding tanks, and that can allow for a large amount of evaporation to be occurring, while others pump water into closed holding tanks, such as the one in the bottom left of the screen. Um, and then, you know, like I said, that can be really important when considering seasonal variability. So, for example, during the hot, uh, hot dry summer months, you're going to be having a lot of evaporation occurring, and the concentration of contaminants can be increasing. And then in winter months, when less evaporation is occurring, the tanks will be filling more with water and dilution can be occurring. So that was a major reason, I think, that um, we had a lot of seasonal variability. Um, also, the concentrations in the open holding tanks obviously would be greatly changed due to the heavy monsoon rains in late summer months. And Finally, since there, a majority of these wells were powered by windmills, um, the level of water in the tank really depended on how much wind there was to pump the turbines. So for example, sometimes we would come to a, a site and the tank was completely full, like the one shown in the middle with Navajo Mountain in the background. And other times we would find a storage tank that was very low and likely had, you know, the wind had not been pumping as much water into the tank as others. Um, and then, so we also, you know, besides just having to collect the water from these windmill tanks, sometimes we'd have to collect the water directly from a uh, spigot at the trough because that's the only way um, to collect the water at some of these sites. Um, so there could also be other issues with contamination due to leakage in the underground pipe from the storage tank to the trough. So for all of these reasons, it really made it difficult to generalize about the quality of the aquifer water and made finding linear trends really difficult to uh, distinguish in our data. 
So just some final conclusions. Um, first off, why, why, why this study was important. So, you know, it might be easy for some people um, who don't live on the Navajo Nation to say that, you know, the Navajo people should just go somewhere where they can haul wa regulated water and not use these unregulated water sources for their drinking water. However, you know, it's important to keep in mind the cost and the time spent in hauling water for the Navajo people. So it costs about 71 times what it does for a Navajo person to be hauling water versus an urban water user, um, what they're paying. So it's gonna be a lot more costly. It's taking a lot more time. They live in, some of these people live in very remote areas. Um, you know, they're dependent on, do, on their livestock having space for um, graze, so they can't be moving into the towns or cities where they can get regulated water more easily. So sometimes these are just the closest and easiest um, sources of water for them to be getting their drinking water from. Um, so what was gained? So we um, hope that we provided some insights into the quality of water from the unregulated water sources and believe these, the data can be used for comparison in future studies. And then we provided some insights into the spatial variability of uranium and arsenic concentrations. Um, like I said, we found very high levels in the Coal Mine Canyon, Cameron, and Loop chapters compared to the rest of the study area. And um, while originally I was very much interested in looking at the temporal variability, um, it was very difficult given all of the, you know, previous things that I had showed on the last slide that we had to consider, and then the lack of the long-term data for the individual wells. And so while we definitely had some more work to do, I believe it can be used for comparison to future water quality testing. So that was a major thing that was gained. And then what is needed in the future? Um, so we definitely would like to continue testing these wells to gain an understanding of the long-term temporal variability. Um, it would be nice if we had more hydrologic data, so the static water levels and, you know, doing a more in-depth study into the aquifer quality, uh, um, water quality. Um, it would also be really nice if we could determine the level of use of wells, um, and that would involve doing surveys. So, you know, we know pretty much all of the wells are being used for livestock purposes, um, but they're likely not all used for drinking water um, purposes, although we know that some of them are. Um, but knowing exactly which wells are really highly used for drinking water would be helpful in our future studies. And finally, it would be um, very interesting to determine how effective our communication methods were in disseminating all of the results back to the public. Um, it's definitely something we worked hard to do, but it would be nice to get some feedback from the community on what could be improved or what worked well. Um, and then I just wanted to end with a few acknowledgements. Um, I definitely am grateful to the whole Ingram Lab group um, my, my thesis project could not have been possible without the support of everyone in this group, um, not only with, you know, getting sampling done, obviously sampling 82 um, water sources throughout the western portion of the Navajo Nation was quite the task and without having a large team of people working on it, that would not have been possible. And then with analyzing all of the results in the lab, it was also important to have a large team to be uh, supporting me. Um, I got to say a big thank you to Jonathan Credo, who you can see um, climbing across the pipe to go and collect some water out of the out of the water storage tank. This project definitely would not have been possible without all of his assistance. And my advisors, obviously Dr. Danny Ingram was a major support, and uh, Dr. Rod Parnell was also very helpful, especially with all of the geology and hydrogeologic information that I needed. Uh, my committee member, Dr. Danielle Perry, and then of course, all of the local Navajo people, government officials, and the ranchers who assisted us 
in um, doing our project. And then the, the grant from the National Institute of Environmental Health Services. So with that, I will end and we have time, I believe, for questions. Thank you, Lindsay, Dr. Ingram. At this time, we'll open up for Q&A for 15 minutes. And um, if you'd like to um, go ahead and either raise your hand or, and, or um, do a thumbs up, then I can note a call on you and ask your question directly to the speakers. All right, Dennis McQuillan. Yeah, thank you, um, <clears throat> Jenny and Lindsay. This is a really excellent presentation. Have, have, is there any thought being given to maybe following up and doing some biomonitoring of the, um, of the uptake of arsenic and uranium in people? So this is Jenny. Um, honestly, it's difficult to do that on Navajo. So um, Dr. Johnny Lewis on the UNM side has project with, um, uh, it's called the Navajo uh, Birth Cohort Study, and she has done some of that, and I think they're getting ready to publish. Um, we have done more with animal models, so we also have a pretty um, large project where we're looking at, <coughs> so we're looking at arsenic, well, we've been mainly looking at uranium, but we will be looking at arsenic as well. Um, uptake in uh, sheep, because it's a traditional food of the Navajo mutton, and looking at where the, we see accumulation in specific tissues and organs. So we've, we've looked at that, but we have not pursued looking at um, uh, exposure specifically in people with say blood draws or urine draws. Thank you. Okay, Patrick Longmire. Lindsay, thank you very much for the presentation. Did you see any correlation with any of the major ions, um, bicarbonate or uh, calcium at the different sampling locations? And then if the native, um, the Navajos are drinking this water with uranium above the 30 parts per billion, do they have access to like uh, reverse osmosis filters or any type of filtration? Yeah, so we did do a, a correlation matrix to see if, you know, any sort of correlations were occurring between the different um, things we were testing for. And while there's definitely a strong correlation between ur uranium and arsenic, um, I'm trying to remember now, it's been a while since I've looked at that data, but I believe it was a carbonate maybe that also had a bit of a correlation and that could just be you know due to the, um, the evaporation effects and things like that in the storage tank um, but I'd have to look back into that and then as far as um, filtering goes and you know having some sort of treatment system I mean I think it's, it's kind of widely variable you can correct me or let me know, Janie, if you know more about it, but I believe, you know, some households do and some households don't as much. Right, so um, one issue with trying to put some kind of filter system at these unregulated well point sources is that if they do get saturated with uranium, then you have to change out the filter, which is fine, but then you can't haul those spent filters across Navajo because then you would be transporting and that's part of that 2005 act and so it's very tricky um, but there are people that are working on a few different approaches to trying to do this with very low to no power because of the power issues and then you do have a lot of salts in a lot of these wells so those also are a problem for the um, you know for the filter systems so it's 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 a little bit more difficult than, you know, just putting a Brita, a Brita filter on it and going. The other thing is that with the arsenic and the uranium issues, arsenic again is a metalloid and in, it's naturally more of a negatively charged ion, so anion, whereas the, the everything else seems to be the metals are all cations. So these filters are sort of one or the other. So it's very difficult to get something to, to pull both of those things. So, you know, those are all complex issues that I think 
you know, there are a lot of people that are, you know, trying very hard to, to um, address. Thank you. And just one last question with the arsenic. Um, any speciation, if it's arsenite or arsenate, plus three or plus five oxidation state? Yeah, we're very interested in that. We were trying to build our own liquid chromatography system to do the separation um, and could not get it to quite work. So, um, and then there's also an issue with, you, you definitely have to make sure once you pull a sample to be able to, you know, make you're not making it do that, you right. know, um, read out chemistry. So, but that is something we're very interested in and hope to, to be able to, you know, get past the hump of, of just being able to do the separation. So, but that, that's a really important point. Thank you. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Uh, Dr. Steve Simpkin had a question. Thank you, Carlotta. Uh, Dr. Jones and Ingram. Um, I'm sorry, my web connection's a little bad. I hope I'm not too spotty. But my question was whether you had any well log data or cuttings for these wells. I was wondering if maybe some of the really bad wells that you measured were tapping the alluvial aquifers rather than the bedrock. Um, it's might... definitely a something that we thought was very likely. Unfortunately, I mean, the only real well data that we had for the wells came from um, the database that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation and. For the wells that were very high in uranium and arsenic, of course, they did not really have on file at the well database, so we didn't know what aquifer they were coming from. Um, I mean, we knew some of them were very shallow because they were just the, you know, shallow dug wells that were collecting water from. So those obviously were very likely just coming from alluvial sources. Um, but yeah, we unfortunately didn't have any other well information for the very high ones that we we're finding. I remember that's a problem in places. Thank you very much, you can. Yeah, Thank and you. I wanna add, um, I did have a student back in the late 2000s, um, Nicole Campbell, who looked at um, uranium isotope ratios that you can, kind of, you can then see a little bit better which, which source they're coming from. So she did a small subset of the stuff that Lindsay did. I think there were 14 or 17 wells. Um, and we have a book chapter out on that, but I can certainly provide that to um, Carletta. Maybe that, that, that can be distributed to really look at it. But that's something we probably should revisit now that we have a much broader um, base of, or database of, of wells and maybe look at some of those um, using the, the isotope ratio. Because there really is, not a whole lot of information about the the wells um, or it's really difficult to get to. Um, I had a, a former student, Tommy Rock, who spent a lot of time digging around in different resources to try and find that information. So, um, but I think maybe going back and looking at isotope ratio information for, um, you know, not all the wells, but for a good portion of them might be useful as well. Thank you. Dr. Ingram, about 15 years ago, I did uh, look at wells, uh, uh, log, logs for the summer. So I know that um, Navajo Nation branch has that, but they're like in these old folders. So you have to just look through them. Um, but I see that uh, Dr. Reed is on the line. Thank you for joining, Dr. Reed. He's, yeah, thank uh, you. Yeah, this was a question. Well, yeah, yeah. This is a this was a very good presentation, and I'm I'm in Shiprock, and we don't exactly use the the type of information that comes from here. So hold on. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, this is John. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, okay. he's taking a call. I know he's very busy. We're just so glad to have him on the line. I had the honor, Jenny and I had the honor of working with him when he was on the Navajo IRB with the Gold Key Mine Spill. So it's great to see him. We usually see him at the Navajo IRB meetings. I want to uh, give a question to Dr. Hempel. 
he's on the line and he'd like to ask a question. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. It's awesome. Uh, this has a lot of great information that I'm looking forward to using in the future. Um, question for you all though, is there a way for you all to overlay, I don't know if this data is present or not, but overlay all of the uranium that might be present in the environment with where the coal mines are, or not coal mines, but the uranium mines are versus where they may not have mined. Um, this could be a really useful way of showing that, hey, the uranium mines are actually the cause of a lot of the uranium contamination. Yeah, I mean, we, we did have the map that showed, you know, where the uranium mining occurred and then the um, overall concentrations we we're finding in the wells. But it's definitely a question that is very difficult to answer as far as is it caused by the mining or is it because there's naturally high levels of uranium already present, which is obviously why they mine there, that we're finding very high levels of uranium there. So um, just doing an overlay of the two, it doesn't necessarily answer that question. Um, so it's definitely the question that gets asked the most when we go to chapter meetings is, you know, was this caused by the past uranium mining but it's not an answer we can give very easily because like i said obviously they mined in areas that were naturally high in uranium so and i was just wondering if there's any areas that weren't mined that do have high levels of uranium and then being able to show maybe well oh there. i see what you're saying um yeah i mean as you saw on the maps for the rest of our study area, we didn't find high levels of uranium in the groundwater that we tested. Um, and then they also did not do any uranium mining there. So I guess that could be used as an argument, but we didn't, I didn't test um, the soils and everything else besides just the water. So it's hard to know if, you know, where the uranium ore is present. I don't know. Yeah, if yeah, I would um, direct to you, and maybe you've already read these papers, but um, a few of the papers by Joe Hoover when he was with UNM actually talk about um, geospatial information and distance from known mines. So he tried to do a little bit of that. Um, but you are definitely right. There are some areas like in um, Black Falls, which is in Western Agency, um, there was no mining in that area and those have some of the higher levels. Also, I think in um, the Dilcon area, which is a little bit east of that area. So, you know, there's some question about how, you know, why you see higher levels in some places than others. But I think Joe's papers um, really do a really nice job of trying to do some correlation of distance from mine sites um, and that kind of thing. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Hempel. Um, while we're continuing with this Q&A, we're gonna administer a poll just to get feedback from you. So just um, see that pop up on your screen in a few seconds. Um, Natsi Peterson of the Howardy Foundation has a question. Go ahead, Natsi. Thank you so much. Um, I was really appreciative of the talk and also of the amount of collaboration. And I was wondering if Lindsay could elaborate a little bit more about how much time on a project like this you would put into uh, working with disseminating the information to the mm -hmm. chapter houses and if you could also um, just elaborate a little bit more on how you obtain those resolutions through the chapters and through the agency. Thank you. Yeah, so that it was definitely time consuming to um, one, disseminate the results and two, just to even get the resolutions to begin with. Um, Usually it requires to get a resolution, we had to go to a, um, a planning meeting, like a pre-chapter meeting where they um, added us to the agenda. And then we actually went to the chapter meeting. Um, and usually these chapter meetings are, um, you know, at least three hours. I think the longest one I ever went to was like six hours. And, you know, much of it is in Navajo, which I, do not speak so they, they at times it was um uh it was a test of my will to be sitting there but then they would get to me and um you know usually though we would get the resolutions without um too much debate or anything the local Navajo people were very excited about us doing the study they really wanted to know what the 
results were going to be. So they were very appreciative. They would have some questions, but um, definitely not not any real pushback from the community members. And then as far as disseminating the results, I mean, it was similar, you know, very time consuming going to the chapter meetings. Sometimes they're you know, very far away in the different chapters. The Navajo Mountain chapter is up in Utah. So it definitely is a full day of um, driving and of sitting in the chapter meetings. So, um, but yeah, in total, I mean, I, I can't remember exactly how much time was spent doing those, but it was, it was a good amount of time. And um, Danny's telling me, Danny told me now that they're doing them all on Zoom now, which I'm like, I mean, it was very good to go in person. And I think it's also very helpful to meet with people face to face. So I'm thankful that we had that opportunity. But at the same time, it would have also been very nice to do presentations and the Zoom meetings just because they were so far away and such long meetings at times. Thank you, Nancy, for your question. Uh, Dr. Reed, would you like to ask your question now? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay. as, as I mentioned, this was a very good presentation. And uh, <clears throat> uh, while we don't deal with uh, uh, the same topics that you deal with and as, as the presentation was uh, made, uh, our, ours is more with infectious diseases. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of, uh, uh, of, of, of participants and research projects that we do with infectious diseases and 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 some a lot of the families live in areas where there is no running water in the home and 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 and, and we uh, 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 know that uh, well well family families know uh, that the water that they have uh, is, is not very good. Uh, especially with regard to infectious diseases, and, and they probably have information uh, uh, that, uh, that 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 is uh, very much related to uh, uh, the minerals and the uh, uh, other contaminants in the uh, 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 water, and and <clears throat> and and and, and, and um, with regard to. Uh, 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 Infectious diseases. Uh, we, we 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 try to uh, 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 make it so that uh, we can reduce re reduce them these diseases as much as possible. And and <clears throat> one of the ways that uh, we do that uh, is to uh, uh, is to uh, provide them with uh, 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 water that uh, is from uh, uh, the regular taps here or water that we have. Uh, 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 taken the uh, infectious agent out of, and 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 and, and leave with them. Uh, but then I think that, uh, as I say, uh, a lot of the people who live in homes with no running water, but have to go to the windmills and to uh, these these other places to uh, uh, get 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 uh, water for their home. They 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 all uh, they probably know all all about the. Uh, Minerals and the, the uh, uh, other 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 uh, uh, contaminants that uh, are are in the uh, water that re relate to some of the, some of the topics that you uh, uh, have, that, that that were discussed. So, <clears throat> one one of the things that we have been doing with uh, regard to the homes that we go to, where some of the uh, uh, part study participants of ours uh, live, and and we get the uh, a GPS uh, 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 information, which 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 we then pro uh, uh, provide to to the uh, to those who are within the tribe who uh, 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 need to know where uh, running water needs to be uh, uh, need, is needed. Uh, <clears throat> GPS of the homes that uh, where, where where these uh, uh, patients live. And one of the things that we do, uh, with, well, I don't know whether or not yeah, you, you know about the uh, obesity there is in a lot of babies on, 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 on a reservation. And a lot of babies uh, uh, have, that, have, that, <coughs> have that problem, excuse me, mainly because there is no running water in the home and, 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 and about the only thing that they can buy at the uh, 
uh, nearest trading post uh, are, are, are these sugar sugar uh, uh, containing uh, drinks, which they give uh, uh, to a lot of their babies, and and, and that uh, 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 makes a lot of them overweight, uh, especially overweight for uh, for what for their ages, and so and and, and that. Uh, uh, relates to uh, a number of uh, other health problems that they that that, that they begin to have uh, as as babies, uh, uh, problems with their teeth, for for example, and 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 uh, uh, problem pro problems that they uh, uh, w w with regard to being overweight that they carry for their lifetime or for for a lot of them. But anyway, that, that, that's the. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, that's what that <clears throat> that is what we look for in in the water that uh, they uh, uh, have uh, in 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 their in their homes, and we're hoping that uh, uh, some of the uh, funds that were received uh, uh, recently uh, from from the government with regard to uh, wa water that uh, uh, the, the absence of water the absence of water in the homes of uh, of, of of many of the uh, uh, Navajos on a reservation. We hope that that can uh, that that the funds that they will receive will help to uh, uh, re uh, resolve that problem for, for 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 as many as many people as possible. And and, and again, you know, I I I I, I think that this uh, 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 presentation was very <clears throat> very informative to me, and and I think that we can use some of the uh, information that. Uh, was uh, provided, and then and, and, uh, to uh, uh, even to 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 uh, uh, present uh, along with all of the information that we have gotten to that that will m perhaps hurry hurry along the provision of water run, run, running water in the uh, in, in the homes of uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of the uh, Navajos who. Uh, uh, live in areas of the reservation where there's no running water available. Thank you, Dr. Reed. I agree. Um, Dr. Ingram and her team has really um, done a lot of groundwork in terms of collecting this data that really has implications today with the COVID-19 pandemic. And I hope that um, into the future we can continue to have this dialogue across the different um, sectors, you know, from scientists to engineers to those working in the health field, because we do really need to look at this um, from a holistic view to really address these challenges with related to water, water inequities that relate to health. So I thank you all for joining this webinar series and I greatly appreciate Lindsay and Jenny for this excellent presentation and also um, commend you on your work that you're doing. Jenny's a, um, a role model of mine and what she does, not only in her research, but for encouraging um, those that are coming up um, in this field like myself. So I put a link into the chat box. Our next webinar will be next Wednesday at 2 p.m. MST which will be um, on arsenic concentrations in ground and surface waters across Arizona, including native lands, which will be by Dr. Catherine Proper and Marie Jones. So the register at that link, and then we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.